One of the things that drives me crazy, one of my biggest pet peeves in all the world is when I lose something. When I tell myself I'm going to put it someplace safe and I always am going to know it's here and then I can't remember where I put it, it drives me crazy. And I found out that the average American spends 2.5 days a year looking for stuff they've lost. And I know, that's 60 hours of our lives, you guys. We're never going to get that back. Never, right? It's just gone. Well, as I was getting ready for tonight, um, I don't know if I lost it or if Chewy, the stage manager, um, is playing kind of a practical joke on me or something, but I had two props that are missing. They have been misplaced. You can call them lost. They might be stolen. But can everyone just help me look for them? I've lost my little lamb and my little coin, and without moving and getting out of your seat, could you just check under your chair, see if maybe Chewy put it under there, maybe taped it to something? Anybody find a coin or a, no, that is definitely trash, that's not it. Anybody find a lamb or a, a little coin? I'm really hoping that someone can find it. Did anyone find it front row? Like right here, can you guys check in this area here? Did you find my lamb? Look under your seat, for real, look. You found a coin? Come on down, come on down. You found the coin. Underneath your guys' chair, did you guys find anything? I'm so, Chewy, somebody has stolen my lamb. Okay, now, come on up, you gotta come up on this stage. All right, I need a guy, I need a guy to help me out here. Uh, you, right there, you, come on, yeah, you. All right, give it up for our friends as they come on down. All right, I guess my lamb, you have a coin. This is not my coin. What? You found my lamb! You! I kind of want to kick one of these guys off this stage, but I don't want to do that. That's mean. Come up and play our game, too. Come on. Give it up for our friends. All right. You stand right here. You stand right here. All right. Yeah, you're there. You're there. You're there. Perfect. Okay. You found my lamb. I can sleep tonight. You are amazing. This is not my coin. This was out of your pocket, wasn't it? No, okay, she says no. All right, so what's your name? Amelia. Amelia. Amelia, what color team are you on? Blue. Blue, any blue out there? <laughs> Couple people, all right. All right, what's your name? Roman. What is it? Roman. Say it one more time. Roman. Roman, Roman, what color are you? Green. Green, green? All right, there we go, Roman. My name is Josie. Josie, Josie, what color are you? Green. You're also green, wow. A lot of representation for the green. All right, here's what we're going to do. We talked this morning about a lost sheep. Yes, some of you were listening good. And a lost that you didn't steal like Amelia did. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Can we still be friends? Okay, good. That was the right answer. All right. So tonight we're talking about the parable of the lost son. And to do that, I want to play a game with you guys, but also you guys. So this is an all play. Here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna ask four questions about the story. We're gonna try to put ourselves into the parable of the lost son. And when we do that, you guys have to answer either one, two, three, or four, depending on what you would choose, okay? So first question, if your parents gave you a million dollars, what would you spend it on? Ready? One, two, three, or four. Would you spend it on? Cars, video games, shoes, or travel. Some of you have your hands up already, you know. Amelia says... Four, She travel. says travel. Anybody with Amelia, four? All right, there you guys, there you go. Roman, what are you gonna do? I'd probably buy a car. He's gonna buy a car. He can't drive it, but he's gonna buy it, and it's gonna be awesome, isn't it? All right, what are you gonna do? I would choose four. You would choose four? All right, Josie's picking four, two. All right, anybody shoes? Shoes? You are shoes. I would pick shoes, I think. I love, I'm a sneakerhead. I love shoes. Either one. All right, next question. Let's go. Next question's this. If you could travel anywhere, Mix, where would you go? Are you ready? Number one, a tropical island. Number two, Europe or Paris. Number three, Super Mario Brothers World. Or number four, Disney. Anybody? Where are you going? One or two. One or two? All right, you can do that. You can do that. One or two. Where are you going? Two. Two. Roman says two. Josie. I would go uh, either one or four. One or four. All right, I'm going four. Anybody going to Disney with me? All right, let's go see Mickey. All right. Third question. Here we go. Third question. If you had to find a way home from camp, 
Your folks called, your grandparents called, they said, sorry, we can't pick you up. If you had to find a way home from camp, you guys, how would you get home? One, ride a tricycle. Two, a golf cart. Three, I, you would hitchhike or four, a scooter. All right, what are you doing? I see two, a golf cart. What would you do? A golf cart all the a way. A golf cart, what would you do? Golf cart. What? Golf cart. Golf cart. Uh, golf cart. Golf cart, would anyone take the tricycle? Anybody, that's, that's it right there. All right, can I, can I tell you guys what I would do? I know this is like a little embarrassing, but I would, I would take the Lime scooter. Here's why. I would take that, I, I love them, they're so much fun, but here's the thing I want you to know, never, under any circumstances mix, should you try to video yourself while riding the scooter, it will go badly. Check this out. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> My phone in my hand. Ah! All right, well, I didn't break any bones. I live to tell about it, but never do that. You guys, it's a bad idea. Our last question, are you ready for our last one? All right, here we go. If you were lost, who would you listen to for directions? Number one, Baby Yoda. Number two, Mr. Beast. Number three, The Rock. Or number four, Serena Williams. What are you, what are you thinking, Roman? Probably The Rock. The Rock, The Rock. Anybody else, The Rock? Three? Yes, all right, what are you? Amelia, the rock. the rock, for sure. What about you? Um. Josie, which one? The Rock. The Rock, everyone's listening to The Rock. All right, you guys, that was, um, what? wait a second, wait. Did some of you, how many of you said Mr. Baby Yoda? There's my Star Wars fans, a couple, all right. All right, guys, here's the deal. You guys played my game. Thank you so much for coming up. You're green team, right? Yeah, you saved my lamb. I'm going to give it right back to you. I know you're not red team, but maybe you could make a friend with a red team. Give it up for our friends. Give it up for our friends. Good job, everybody. Now, I know, you guys, it's pretty silly if we think about, it's pretty silly to think about going home riding a tricycle down I-65. It's pretty silly to think about that. It's also... Equally as silly to think about directions from Baby Yoda. But can I tell you something that's not silly? Here's something that's not silly. Who we listen to really, really matters. Who we listen to matters. And tonight, Jesus has a broadcast for us through this parable. He wants to speak right to our hearts tonight if we would be willing to let him. So here's what I want you to do. Take your hands like this. Put them right over your ears. Not on them like you can't hear me, like la, 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 like you do to your siblings. Not like that. Not in your ears because earwax, but we're just going to pray over our ears really, really fast. Are you ready? Pray with me. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you are speaking to us tonight. Help us to listen and not to be distracted in Jesus' name. And everyone whispered, amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 15. If you have your Bible, can you kind of wave it at me? Let me see it. I want to make sure you brought it. Let me get it. You can get it. All right. Luke 15. What? It glows in the dark. I love it. All right. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Luke chapter 15. All right. I'm going to give you a second to get there. Here's the deal about the Bible. Everybody, you don't need to talk to open it up. So let's quiet down and listen. Shh cool. You guys, Luke chapter 15, it's in the back of the Bible. It's in the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. If you find the book of John, you've gone too far. You need to go back a little bit, okay? Here's the deal. If you're new to this book and you're like, I, I don't know. All I know is the pages are so crazy thin and the words are so small. If you're new to this book, that is okay. I want you to know there's a table of contents right in the front. You'll be able to get to Luke or you can lean over to your leader and just say, psst, I don't know where Luke 15 is, all right? And they will help you find it. All right, Luke chapter 15, Jesus is telling a parable. He told the parable of the lost sheep and then the lost coin and now the lost son. He told these right in a row, like bam, bam, bam. There were no breaks. Now, I know we told two parables. We took a long break. We did all the fun things. Now we're here. But when Jesus' original hearers heard the story, they would have heard these three parables in a row, like a truth trifecta. Here we go. Verse 13 starts like this. 
or no, sorry, verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Time out. Before we go any further, we need a little context. Now, I don't know, um, I don't know if context, I know that's kind of a school word, but whenever we read God's words, you guys, we have to know the context. What do I mean by that? Check out this, uh, check out this slide from your student book. This right here says, when we are reading the Bible, which you guys are gonna kind of go through all this tomorrow, look for the context. You see that number one? Who are the characters? Who, what is the setting? Imagine the sights and the sounds. You guys, the context gives meaning to what we're reading. So for example, back in Jesus's day, the culture was different. They had some things that we don't do today that were like really, really normal to them. And it's so helpful for us to know the context. Now, my, um, my friend Carmen got me this, this game. I don't know if you've ever played it. Raise your hand if you've played it. What do you mean? This is the family edition. It's clean, don't you worry, all right? Now, what do you mean? Shh, memes? Memes are seriously my favorite. I love trying to take a funny picture or a GIF and trying to make it like the perfect thing to, to highlight what I'm trying to say. For example, if you were to text me and say, Jacqueline, how was your day? And I would just say, it was awful, all right? You'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry, you had a bad day. But if I were to text you, it was awful, and then I send this gif, this meme with it, of a dumpster fire, right? You would be like, whoa, sister had a bad day, right? You would, it would like give a whole new meaning to what you're talking about. All right, we can stop that gif. It's just going to keep going and going and going. So you guys, context, don't miss this, context, if you're taking notes, it's like a meme. It gives understanding and meaning and it sheds light on what we're reading. So when you're in the Bible and you're like, huh, that just doesn't make sense to me. Sometimes you got to be like, okay, what's the context? What's the setting? Who are we talking about? And what is going on in their culture that maybe I don't know? So here's the thing, you guys. The son asked for his father's, his inheritance before his father dies. This is unheard of in their culture. They never would have done this. And what is he basically saying? I wish you were dead. Dad, I don't care about you. I just want you for your money, right? The original hearers, the original audience, which were the tax collectors and the sinners and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, you kind of have like the good guys and the bad guys, right? Or the bad guys and the good guys. They would have gasped like this. <gasps> when they heard that, like gasping in Spanish. Can you guys gasp in Spanish with me? <gasps> right? I mean, seriously, that's what they would have done. They would have been so confused. But don't miss it, it gets worse. The father gives the money to the son. You guys, not only was it unheard of for a son to ask for his inheritance while his dad's alive, but it's even more unheard of for the father to say, sure, Take it. Jesus is doing something. I don't want us to miss this. Jesus is doing something from the beginning of this parable. He's basically saying the younger son, he's a mess. He's making him look really, really bad. And he's making the father look extra gracious and generous. Let's keep reading and find out what's going on. All right. So context is everything. Everybody say everything. Context is everything. And we're going we're gonna to pause for context as we walk through this passage because it is everything and it's going to make, make this story make so much more sense. Verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land where there he wasted his money in wild living. When you guys went to camp, you packed a suitcase or a bag or a duffel or maybe a backpack. Maybe some of you are like, hmm. Forgot to pack, still wearing the same clothes, right? But when you do that, you have a suitcase full of stuff, but you don't pack everything, right? You leave some books. You might have brought a book, but you left a bunch of books in the bookshelf. You left pictures on the wall. You didn't pack everything because you had plans to come home after camp, or at least I hope you did, okay? But this guy, this is a clue. Don't miss it. It's a clue to what we're reading where it says this, he packed all his belongings, you guys, he had no intention of going home, ever. 
Like he was literally packed up all his stuff and he was out and he goes to a distant land where he blows all of his money. He doesn't just spend it. I mean, he's wasting it, going crazy and he's partying. And then verse 15, something bad happens. About the same time the money runs out, it says a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into field the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Context is what? Some of you are listening. I love it. Context is everything. So the thought for me of working with smelly pigs, it's just, it's not Peppa Pig, you guys. It's disgusting and it's gross and it's nasty. Some of you are like, no, Peppa Pig is all of those things. But you guys, it was, it was not a pleasant experience. If you've ever driven down a country road, you can sometimes smell the pig farm from like a mile away. This young man is so hungry and so desperate that he's literally working with pigs. Now, for us, we're like, okay, he's working with pigs. This is where context is everything. Back in their day, you guys, it was illegal. It was not acceptable for God's people, for the, for the Jewish people. It was against their law for them to, to have any contact with pigs. It would make them unclean. And so the people, once again, they would have gasped. They would have been like, no, not the oinkers, like anything but the pigs. Like, you've got to be kidding me. They would have been absolutely like, this story is awful, okay? This young man, he has offended his dad. His dad gives him the money. And now the guy's wasted all the money and he's in a pig pen. And this story could not get any worse. You guys, he's hit rock bottom in a pig pen. Now, I wonder... I wonder if we were really honest in this place tonight, if we ever find ourselves not in a physical pig pen, not like I live on a farm and that's part of my chores, not that way, but I wonder if we ever find ourselves in that kind of a mess. We're like this younger son, we feel desperate, we feel alone, we feel like no one sees us or knows what we're going through, that we feel stuck, we feel far, far away from, from maybe God or our family or friends, and we feel like we are just stuck in a pig pen. You guys, that is where our younger brother is in the story tonight. Let's keep reading and find out what happens to him. Verse 17, some good news. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare, and I'm dying of hunger. He's like, I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me as your hired servant. You guys know, when we mess up and we need to, like, apologize, maybe you said something mean to your brother or sister, your mom's like, you need to make it right. You go, you apologize, they forgive you, all is well. Or at least that's how it's supposed to go. But... In this, in this case, the, this guy has done something so bad that it's not just a, hey, dad, I'm sorry, I'm back. Can I have my room back? No, it's, it's a lot more than that. He's thinking to himself, like, I'm going to have to put a speech together. I'm going to have to, like, write a note, and it's going to be a big deal, and I'm just hoping and praying that my dad will take me back in because right now I'm hungry, and I just want food so that I don't die. That's the desperate spot he's in. One version says, it says he came to his senses. Another said, the son finally realized what he was doing. He finally realized that he's rehearsing his speech. He's on his way home. You guys, I wonder if he was nervous. I wonder if he was scared. I wonder if he was like this. This is one of my favorite nervous gifts. Can you guys make that face with me? I wonder if he was so nervous he started sweating. Anybody sweat like this? Have you ever sweat like this? Maybe you sweat like this at camp today. You're like, no, I literally know what that's like, right? I wonder what he was thinking about on his way home. You guys, I wonder if he was thinking about the fact that when he walked that road before, he had a bunch of stuff. He had money. He had friends. He had hopes and dreams of parties and all kinds of cool stuff. And now he's walking. I don't even know if he had a suitcase with him because my guess is he didn't have anything to put in it. He had lost his friends, he had lost his dignity, he had lost his family, he had lost money, he had lost purity, he had lost everything. But he's going home, he's reciting his speech, and verse 20 says this, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still what? A long way off, 
His father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, hugged him, kissed him. His son said to him, and he starts a speech. He's been rehearsing it for miles now. And he says, he says his whole thing, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And it's like, it's like the father didn't even hear him. You guys, let's, uh, context is what? What was that word I said? Everything. everything. Yes, context is everything. Middle Eastern men, fun fact, never ran. I don't know why, actually I do know why, but it's a little bit silly and it, it's one of those things that I'm like, that's weird that they didn't run, they didn't have marathons, I don't know, but they wore robes and Middle Eastern men, when they wore robes, if you're gonna run in a robe, I haven't tried it, but apparently you kinda have to hike the robe up and that was considered undignified. It was like a no-no for Middle Eastern men to run in prance in their robes. It would be the equivalent of a dad running through the neighborhood in his boxer shorts, right? Some of you are like, oh, no, dad, no, bad idea, right? So here is this man that is running to see his son. You guys, he's not letting culture stop him. He's not letting the normal stop him. He is so pumped to see his son that he's sprinting for him. You guys, context is everything, and it helps us to see a clearer picture of what's going on. You guys, he was so filled with love and compassion for his boy. You know what those words remind me of, love and compassion? Wanted and welcomed. You guys, listen, those that walk away are still wanted and welcomed in God's kingdom. I want to show you this. When Jesus tells his parable, this is a window, in case you didn't know. It's a window. And this window is what Jesus is giving us in this parable. What do I mean by that? Jesus wants us to see what God is really like. You guys, he wants us to see that God is not mean. He's not hateful. He's like, golly, son, it's about time you came home. I'm so angry. You wasted all my money. You good for nothing. Blah, blah, blah. Lazy kid. No. You guys, Jesus is giving us a window into the heart of the Father, where we can look through this window and he says, you wanna see what God the Father is like? Look at the Father in this story. If you look through the window, you see a father running towards his son. You see a father who is forgiving and kind. See, some of you guys, you've done some stuff that you're not proud of. You've been in that pit of sin and you feel like, man, I don't know if I can ever get out. Or even worse, You've been listening to the broadcast of the enemy and it kind of sounds like this. I don't think I can come back. I've done too much. I've lied too much. I've gossiped too much. I've watched too much. I've drank too much. I wonder, you guys, if some of you are believing the lie of the enemy that you can't come back because you think that God is mad at you. You think that God doesn't want you anymore, that he doesn't care about you anymore. You think you've done too many bad things and that he doesn't, no, he wouldn't want me. You guys listen to me, mix, listen, have ears to hear what the Lord wants you to hear tonight is that he is waiting and longing for us to come home. And he, his heart towards us isn't angry or mad. He's not up there with a lightning bolt, like ready to strike you down. I saw what you didn't know. You guys, he is looking and waiting and longing for you to run home into his arms. That is the heart of the father. But Jesus also does something else. With this parable, he gives us a mirror. I won't flash this at you because the lights and someone will be like, seizure, you know, it'd be bad. Um, but he gives us a mirror. This is what, watch what I'm gonna do here. He gives us a mirror and mirrors we know are to look at ourselves and to take a really good look at our heart and say, how have I like the younger son, how have I walked away from God? How have I, how have I walked away? You guys, I know that in this room that some of us have walked away from him. We had a relationship with him and then for whatever reason, maybe we got involved in the pit of sin, in the pig pen of sin, and we just kind of, uh, I don't know if I can come back. Maybe some of you guys, you're new here. You're like, I don't even know about this Jesus thing and this Bible thing and we're singing these songs and it looks like a lot of fun. And I'm here to tell you some really good news tonight. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. I want you to read this verse. Read this with me. It's Romans 5, 8. It says, while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. You guys, when you look in the mirror of our own lives, we see, man, I, I have walked away. Some of you are going to identify with that younger son. You're going to be like, hmm, that is me. I am the pig pen kid. Like, that is me. You guys know, you're going to learn about this tomorrow, when the older son story is told. He was prideful. He thought he was better than everybody else. He thought that he was good because of all the stuff he did. And when the tax collectors and the, no, sorry, when the religious leaders and the Pharisees, when they hear this story and they look in the mirror, they're like, oh, snap, that older brother's me. Well, guess what? When the sinners and the tax collectors, when they look in the mirror of this parable, they see themselves in that younger brother. I wonder how you've walked away. The Bible says all of us have sinned, all of us have messed up, and that Jesus took care of that on the cross for us. You guys, he is the way. Jesus says of himself in John 14, 6, if you're taking notes, you can write this down and look it up later. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, and I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and nobody gets to the Father except through me. You guys, our gracious God gave us Jesus so that we could go home to him. Now, I know the word home is tricky. Some of you guys are like, Jacqueline, you're talking about coming home, and I don't really love home. Home is fighting. Home is arguing. Home is empty. Home is one parent's not there anymore. Home is, I don't know what your home is like. But you know what we have in Jesus? We have the opportunity not just to have a heavenly home that's perfect someday with no pain, with no anxiety, with no tears, that we can be with God forever That's the hope of heaven. That's our ultimate home. But you guys, we can have home in a relationship with Jesus, with the Father, that we can feel forgiven and loved and accepted. All those things we look for in friends and on social media, we can have that kind of love and that kind of acceptance with our Father. Our home is in him. I want you to meet Mason. This is my oldest son. This is him when he was a baby. He was 18 months old in this picture. And this was actually taken a couple days after I met him. See, Mason, if he was here, he's 12 now, almost 13. He'll be here in a couple days at Mix. If he was here, he would tell you that home when he was little wasn't a safe place. Home was kind of a scary place. And because of that, Mason ended up in the foster care system. And I got a phone call one day that changed my life forever when they said, hey, we have this little boy for you. Would you be willing to give him a home? My husband and I, we were so excited to pick up this little guy and he changed our lives. But one day when he was three, Mason was always, he was just goofy and funny, but he had this like weird thing where he would sometimes just say something. You're like, how did you know that? Like, how do you know this? And one night I walk in, I'm I'm putting clothes away in his room and he's sitting there playing Thomas the Trains on his bed and he's being cute. And like I say, he's like three years old and I see this cross on the wall and I said, Mason, um, what, what is that? He said, it's a cross. I said, yeah, you're right. I said, who died on that cross? And he doesn't even look up from the Thomas to trains. He's focused. He's playing. He's like, easy, Jesus. I'm like, preacher's kid. You're good. You're good. Yes, you're right. And then I ask him a question. I still don't know why I would ever ask a three-year-old this. And I don't recommend it. It's the weirdest thing. I don't even know why it came out of my mouth, but I'm so glad I did. I said, Mason, why did Jesus die on the cross? He thought for a second, he paused what he was doing, he put his hand on his heart, and he said, so Mason can go home. You guys, that is the gospel. That's the good news. You guys, he wasn't talking about his first home. He wasn't talking about his birth family. He wasn't talking about our home because we were already home, right? You guys, somehow the Lord put that little line in his mark, so Mason can go home. Do you know, do you know that tonight is some of y'all's night to come home. It's your night to say, hey, you know, Jesus, I've been scared to come back because I'm afraid you're angry and you're mad at me, God, and I don't know. And this right here, this window reminds you that he is waiting for you and looking for you and longing for you to come home. Some of you guys, you've been around church your whole life. You're like my kids. You're like the pastor's preacher kid. You're like, hey, I, I know all this stuff, but now it's time to not be your parents' faith anymore. It's time to be yours. And you're, it, tonight is your night to say, Lord, I'm coming home. I want to put my faith and my trust in Jesus. You guys, listen to me. Those who walk away are still wanted and welcomed in his kingdom. It's time to come home.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for the picture that we get of you in this parable. God, it is so amazing to see your goodness and your kindness and your love towards us. God, that you want us, even after we mess up, even after we blow it, that you still want to welcome us with open arms. Jesus, thank you for dying for us and making that possible. Lord, I pray tonight that many, many, many of your children would finally say, hey, I'm here. It's time to go home. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen.